you're one week away from mixing three bands at a local outdoor concert series on the city square. The production company has a generic PA spec, but it's up to you as a freelancer coming in to decide how exactly it's going to be deployed. So what's going to be your plan for assessing the rig, designing it, making a plan, and then implementing it right in the field? So that was me a couple months ago. And today I want to walk you through step by step how I went through all these processes of gathering the right data, making the plan, and eventually implementing this funny looking subarray in the field. Throughout this walkthrough, I'll be referencing several tools available in my audio toolkit produced by mkc.com slash audio toolkit. Um, one of them the main ones being the audio math survival spreadsheet. It's got over 30 different calculators that help you make your PA design systems uh, quickly. And so if you've read Bob McCarthy's book, it's got a ton of his system design stuff all packed in there. And we're going to be using a ton throughout this video. So if you need help with system design, I'd really recommend getting it at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit. This walkthrough is going to be in five sections. First being the brief. What is the show? So what info did I get from the production company and from having gone to this event before to kind of get a general feel of what to expect? Number two, how I gathered the right data using tools like Google Maps and what manufacturer specs I'm looking for on the speaker rig itself. Third, the actual design of the rig. So using system design software like Ease Focus 3 and Map 3D to put together a plan. And fourth, deployment and execution. So coming into show day with all the right tools uh, and checklists to make sure the rig goes up quickly and efficiently. And number five, conclusion. And next time, what am I going to go do differently as the show comes throughout the months? All right, thanks for joining me. Let's jump right in. Okay, here's the brief. Here's what I do know about the show before I start making a plan. Again, I'm a freelance A1, and they've hired me to design the system and mix for the show. It is a local outdoor concert series on the city square. It's going to be three bands on a 16 by 20 stage. It's a normal sound check schedule. I uh, will load in at seven, sound check around uh, two or three, and then first uh, band goes on at five. All right. So beginning with the end in mind, you can see what things look like uh, from out in the audience during the second act. So this was in the middle of the show. Uh, you can see here, uh, there's the sage uh, with the band on it. And then we have uh, a 40 foot stick of truss up top with 25 foot crank lifts. These were not at their full 25 foot height. We'll talk later about how I ended up getting the final trim height, but th those are some, some design factors are gonna be coming back to is that I had 40 foot PA spacing or I could go farther in if I wanted to, but that was the max I needed because we had to have lights hanging off that 40 foot truss. So 25 foot cranks, 40 foot stick of truss. Uh, as you can see in the main audience, it's not. Uh, it's, this is not a Megadeth show. We don't have to get this crazy loud. It's, it's families hanging out. Um, I, I had a lot of you know friends there coming to see those bands. It's a very family friendly event that doesn't have to be the loudest thing in the world, but needs to be energetic and fun. So maximum SPL is not a priority here. Okay, there was a VIP audience on a rooftop nearby. Uh, I couldn't really do anything specific about that, but I was made known it needs to sound good for them too, which just means make it sound good on the ground as well. Okay, here's the gear list. I had an M32 with no external DSP or speaker processing. So that meant I had to do all delay setting, any system EQ, any routing, whatever, had to be from the console itself. So I ended up using some matrices and the output patching to handle all that. Um, it was gonna be sitting next to the stage and use all the local IO. So the flown PA package I had was at RCF HDL6A. So that's RCF's smallest uh, proper line array box. Those are six inch woofers with a, with a compression driver, dual sixes with a compression driver. Um, and I had uh, 12 total. So it made sense to do two hangs of six. Uh, I had fill speakers for four QSC K12s. Uh, I'll probably do how I, the fill system differently next time than I did in this photo. Um, and then for subs, I had four QSC KW181s, and I definitely will still keep this funny looking sub array, which we'll get to in Map 3D. I had a normal mic package and stands and all that, um, and I was able to pull the specs of the these three speaker types in my speaker database, which is another resource you have in my audio toolkit. So here are three things I still don't know and I need to answer in the next session when I da uh, gather all the data. What are the exact dimensions of the audience? So uh, do not need to cover the entire square, just a part, and um, what makes sense there? Uh, what is my exact trim height I can bank on? 
And then number three, are the HDL 6As, are they both powerful enough and have the right coverage? They are a 100 degree box to cover the area I want. So we have to gather data, put that in our software and answer that what's going on. Okay, so let's answer those questions and a few more in the next section, data gathering. Here we are, data gathering, everyone's favorite part of the show. So this is uh, kind of nerdy and I really enjoy it, but I feel like without good data to input into your design software, you're not gonna get great results. So here are four questions worth asking before we actually get into the numbers. So where can you put your speakers? Is there some unspoken thing in video world about the camera shot is all that matters so they don't wanna see speakers? Do you have trim height limitations? Um, or there are there sight lines to some screens that you need to be aware of? So this is an outdoor show, there's no video on it, so I didn't have too much to worry about, but always great to ask yourself, uh, where is your primary audience? So you may have, uh, it's a conference and there's just 500 people in a room, and so make sure they're, they're great. What about if they have really expensive VIP tickets in the front row? So you need to make sure those front fills are sounding great. So know what your priorities are there. Uh, are there any SPL requirements or limitations? So on a metal show, it needs to be loud everywhere, but this one's an outdoor family event. So it needs to be fun and energetic, but I'm not too worried about how to make it super loud and proud. So, and then fourth, what other tools do I need to maybe familiarize myself with uh, to put my data in so I can gather it in the right way? So we're using Ease Focus 3 by AMFG for um, since that's what RCF uses as its prediction software. I'm also going to use Map 3D from Meyer for my subarray because there's really not a great option uh, within um, Ease Focus 3 to make really cool subarrays. So anyway, uh, we're going to be using and putting all the data into my audio math survival spreadsheet. This can be great. I really owe a ton to Nathan Lively, uh, Merlin Manbean, and definitely Bob McCarthy for all I've learned from them. So I'd say 80% of the spreadsheet is just stuff I've stolen from them and put into here. Uh, but some other th things I put together, this has greatly improved my workflow. Okay, so we let's jump into our PA data. So we've got um, an RCF HDL 6A. This is the product page. I scrolled all the way down and this is the GLL file. So this uh, more or less contains a bunch of data about the speaker itself and I import this system definition file into Ease Focus 3 and hey, I've got that speaker there. So it'll show me the 10 degrees by 100 degrees, its specific frequency response, how it arrays, how much the weight is, all that is put together in this GLL file. So companies that aren't using a proprietary software, it's important to get a file like this that you can import into some third party solution. So I did that as, uh, as well for the QSC K12s and the KW181s, uh, and we could put that in our Ease Focus 3 software. So what to know about our um, HDL 6As is the next data is like, how wide is the speaker? So it's 100 degrees horizontal coverage and 10 degree vertical coverage. Our K12.2s are 75 degrees wide and 75 degrees tall, so they're a conical shape. So this is my speaker database, something I've started in my audio toolkit, um, along with the audio mass survival spreadsheet. So another thing I decided on was the trim height. So um, if I knew the stage is gonna be here and it's gonna be about 25 feet to that curb, uh, 25 feet is all the way up for those forks. The PA is gonna hang a little bit from the rigging and then the first box. So I knew it'd be at least a foot if it went all the way up. Honestly, all the way up freaks people out, even if it's stable to see a PA that high off a skinny looking fork. And if it's windy that day, we don't want it swaying. So I compromised and started with a 20 foot trim height for those boxes. Okay, so I know uh, my speaker coverage dimensions. I know my trim height. Now let's move on to more data we gathered from our audience. So if we go here to Google Maps, you can right click and do measure distance. And then I went from this Back over here, the, this picture from Google Maps has these tents up actually during a first Friday, this actual event, which is pretty cool, or at least the setup for it. But I was able to measure and see that the audience from that curb we saw earlier, this curb right, right here, sorry, uh, all the way up to uh, basically the back other division of the square was 100 feet deep and it was 160 feet wide from the edge of this brick curb over to here. 
So that is super, super wide, 100 degree speaker in the center. So I can't do a single center hang, which I usually don't, but just to know that we have to divide and conquer. This also tells me we can't do a true stereo PA since we need the majority of the audience being covered by both speaker sets. So this was definitely a divide and conquer situation. So I was gonna have the PA start here and then we'd have to point out this way and then be on this side and point this way because I have a truss. Uh, remember, we're hanging off of that's 40 feet across the stage and the PA is going to be off of that and I'm going to end up towing the PA out. So that's something I know. I, I can't shoot straight on. I could, but I know the edges of the audience are going to suffer. So what do we need to do when our audience is too wide for one speaker array? We're going to divide and conquer. So how I did that was looked here and just drew two boxes of you know our left half and our right half. And that gives me something what's called my forward aspect ratio. And how do we do that? So I can go over here to my audio mass survival spreadsheet and go to coverage area FAR. So my audience depth is 100 feet and the width of just its own section because we're dividing in half is 80 feet. And that gives me 1.25. So the depth divided by width. And you can do this with any audience. You just measure through the middle of the middle to get your width and then how deep it is basically from the first row to the back row. And then you can put that in reverse and convert the room forward aspect ratio to the needed speaker that's gonna have the perfect shape to cover that. And so this FAR of 1.25 is 106 degrees, which is really, really close to 100 degrees in the HDL6A. So I do know that we are in good shape with this PA to be able to cover that. So I'm gonna go over here. And again, I would have these boxes pointed here and then the edges of our truss and then pointed right through the center here to get the most even coverage from its own particular zone. Okay, to recap, we looked at our PA and found its coverage angles. So our main hang is 10 degrees by 100 degrees. We use that data to see like, okay, can the speaker cover the audience I needed to cover? So we pulled up Google Maps, measured our complete size, decided that we needed to divide and conquer the PA and make it multi-mono, not stereo. Uh, we got the FAR of 1.25 and converted that to our needed speaker coverage angle of 106 degrees. 100 is super close to that, so I felt great about it. And we decided decided on our trim height of 20 feet because we didn't want to go too high and freak people out, didn't want the wind swinging around, so 20 feet was a good place to meet. Okay, now with all, oh, sorry, and we decided that our stage was going to be about 25 feet from that curve, so my front fills were probably going to have to take care of that first 20 to 25 feet and the PA all the way back from that 100 feet from that curb to the back of the fountain. Let's jump into now the system design. All right, now for our system design, the fun part. We're gonna take all the data we've gathered from our speakers, our audience, and the actual show itself and make a really good stab at having a plan ahead of time uh, for load-in. You know, things may change on site, that's out of our control, but I feel like having a great plan, a one-pager that tells you all I need to know about where I'm putting my boxes, my splay angles, my sub placement is a, is a great place to be so you can be calm, cool, and move fast on load-in. So let's get our bearings back. We have our main hang of six HDL 6As off to the side. We got our subs down here in the center and then our fills here off left and right. Uh, next time, I'm just gonna do one uh, fill off here, one in the center, one off to the side, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So just so you can have a visual reference now that we're gonna jump into the design file. So before we do that though, I want to make you aware of where we're gonna be at in the spreadsheet. We're gonna be at row 112, asymmetric composite couple point source design. That is a long word for how to make a line array sound good. All the, And so the orange are inputs, the blue are outputs. And so much of this is informed by the work of Bob McCarthy and Merlin Van Veen. Um, so this is a killer graphic. I found it on Merlin's blog post called Pick Your Battles. It's about low mid frequency frequency beaming and stuff. So if you want to get super nerdy, you can go there. I'll have a link down below. Uh, but anyway, this is just a beautiful graphic that really sums up a great approach to, to making a line array. So you can see here that um, 
in this particular case, he has eight boxes in the array, and he has subdivided the array into three composite elements, an A array, a B array, and a C. Um, and we can use these groupings to do different things. We can bend uh, basically the wave front in different ways by using our splay angles. So let's first talk about range ratio. So uh, we don't have the actual feet measured here, but we can trust that this top element, the A box is throwing five times as far as the C box is trying to throw. So we're not gonna use gain shading or level to, to help take care of this discrepancy. We're going to use how the boxes are coupling together or being narrowly splayed, or they're gonna be wide, therefore not having a lot of overlap and, dis and dispersing more. And so we can look at each of these coverage uh, each of the angles between the boxes of way of saying, hey, if we're nice and narrow, we're going to couple and go farther. If we're spread out, we're going to be farther apart. So I've recreated this graphic for, for my line array on what I use for First Friday. Um, so the range ratio in my case, it was four to one. So um, I can look here and see that this top box I knew was throwing four times as far as the bottom element here. And we'll talk about how I ended up with three groups of two boxes, as you can see over here. Uh, but how I got this multiplier um, is I knew my A array was at one degree for here. And then this, this next splay angle is more of a hinge that gets us to our next B composite element. And this five degree is a hinge that gets us to the C element. And so I'm able to see where each of these are throwing. And this is also gonna be the measurement positions I'm gonna be putting mics where I am tuning the array. So if you really wanna have a super huge handle on what's going on, you just need to get this book. Um, there's so much good information, but I'm just basically doing the crash course version here uh, to give you an insight as to how that's all working together. So bottom line, get your range ratio is what we need to figure out. Um, and so let's go do that in our design software. So I've got Ease Focus 3 pulled out. Let me give you a quick tour of what you're seeing here. I've imported a screenshot of downtown Bentonville, um, and I can use this uh, user's guide, walks you through how to do that if you want to do it on your show. And so that way, all my measurements that are in feet are accurate, and I can trust that what I'm seeing here is actually mapped to the right amount of feet. Uh, you go to File, uh, import system definition file, and these are the GLL files that I, that I use. So that's the HDL6A GLL files, our main line array, then my K12, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, fill speakers is what I use. I did not do subs in here. I did that in Map3D, which we'll get to a little bit later. So I have here my audience zone, which is a 160 feet wide by 100 feet deep, and that's from front of the stage or um from the front of the stage out uh that had this other zone to, so i could see what my fill speakers were doing over here if i go here and click on an actual array it shows me here it's rigging and this is where we're going to mess with uh the display angles between the boxes these um colored little diamonds here that are numbered um are what are called receivers and so i can insert those and that shows us at that given point, what is the frequency response? And this does one octave smoothing, so it's not the best, but it'll give us some data. And of course, this looks like trash right now since our array is not even angled down, it's just shooting off into space. Okay, so I'm gonna, we're gonna spend a lot of time here in side view. Uh, so let's first take care of our horizontal aiming. We're going to do our main array first because we're going to work from biggest to smallest. Uh, so main array are fill speakers, and then we'll pop over to Map 3D and do our subs. So what we need to figure out um, is our horizontal aiming by aiming through the middle of the middle. So if this was our whole audience, we're now going to subdivide and say, hey, the house right array only take care of the right side. So only take care of that. And then I can draw... Um, some lines right here and know that if I make an X of these two corners, I know that if I can 
basically aim right to this X. That's the middle of the middle of that side. I did not end up towing out that far for two reasons, because, um, if people see a PA towed out real wide, even if it's technically correct from a coverage standpoint, they just get nervous. They just start hearing things that aren't actually there because like that looks funny uh, first. And then second, I knew that just from having been at this event before, just as a normal civilian spectator, uh, that most people were going to sit in not too far off to the side. The people who really wanted to be there and listen to the music were going to be focused on the center within like the middle third of the audience. So I still wanted to cover why because I didn't want too much overlap, uh, but that's why I didn't go all the way out. So what you see here with these receivers is me being able to point. Um, I had the array pointed here and I'm concerned about getting and knowing the frequency response of the array on axis or where it is pointed. So let me fine tune that here. I think I had it at 102 degrees. Yeah, so that's basically seven degrees out from 90 um, or 12 degrees out, sorry. From 90 is where I ended up. So that is our horizontal aiming. Uh, that's the easy part. Now let's move on to the hard part, which is our vertical aiming. Basically, how do we decide the splay angles between the boxes? Because we already have figured out we're on the end of our truss. We have a fixed trim height and I have it five feet in front of the stage. So our actual placement of the array itself is already decided. So the only thing we can do now to change the actual coverage shape of the array is splay angles and gain shading between the boxes, which gain shading is definitely a last resort. Okay, so now let's do a little bit of Pythagorean theorem, <clears throat> everyone's favorite thing. So I'm going to show you here that just like in our other graphic we looked, we needed to see what was the throw distance from the top element to the very back and the bottom element to the very front. Uh, and I'll remind you that this first receiver is more or less at what that curb is, um, where, you know, at the stage in the street and up to that curb and people are going to usually spread out in blankets past that. That's where this receiver is. And then this is the very back. Okay. Let's figure out our range ratio. And we can do that by figuring out our top box throw to the back versus the bottom box throw to the front. So we're going to have to do a little bit of Pythagorean theorem here. Uh, so we can measure from our ear height, which is about 5.6 feet in this instance, up to our top box. Um, I know a top is at 20, ear height is at 5.6. So 20 minus 5.6 is 14.4, okay? And then I also know that from basically the front of the array all the way to the back of the audience is 100 feet. So that gives us those two sides of the triangle. So now we have to figure out what is it from here to here. And this is where we get to do a little bit of math. So that is 14.4 uh, squared plus 100 squared equals 10,207.36. 10, if we put that in our handy dandy calculator, we can see that our throw distance is 101 feet. I'm now gonna go put that over here in our asymmetric composite couple point source design spreadsheet. So our very top, this is a Bob McCarthy for how far our top box is. So it's 101 feet. And we'll go put some more data in there. So now what is our bottom box to listening height? And then from here to this first row, just to keep things moving along, I happen to know that is from the bottom. Here is uh, 16 minus 5.6. It is 10.4 and then that is 24 feet to that first row. So let's put that in. So 10.4 squared plus 24 squared equals 584.16. Put that in calculator and that is 26. All right, boom. So that gives us our range ratio right here. So that's our top throw divided by our bottom throw. And so that means that is a 11.8 dB change front to back if we don't use 
some things to help us out. <laughs> um, and that gives us also our coverage ratio. So if we double our range ratio, that's the coverage ratio that Merlin Van Veen recommends. Okay, so now we've got that. Now we need to fill in the angles to know like, okay, do we have enough splay out of our six boxes to make that all work? So I can use a tool called Pixel Stick to figure that out for me. So I've got it pulled up here at the top. And here I can say I've got a seven degree down tilt from the top to the back. So I'll put in minus seven. And now I'm gonna go here from the bottom to the first row. And it's actually going to end up being a little bit steeper than that uh, because the array is going to tilt back some. So I might go a little bit, let's do like neg 24. So that gives me about a 17 degree spread of like total slice of the pie that my array has to cover. So, which is great because uh, we can take our box max play and our minimum and get the average and know that, and it tells me that I need at least four boxes to pull off that 17 degree angle and I have six, so we are in the clear. So that's how to use that. Uh, this part of the calculator is to put in your angles and your range and get your range ratio from the throw distances and you'll be good to go. All right, so now let's actually start plugging some numbers in to see if this will work. <clears throat> so if we go back to our graphic, I ended up using one, two, three, five, seven. All right. Um, and so if we want our coverage ratio to be double a four to one, that's something we know. That means if I'm doing two group of two, group of two, group of two, that means if I double four to one, I need to get eight to one. But this these boxes don't have a seven degree splay uh, or don't have an eight degree splay. They only have one, two, three, four, five, seven, ten. So I ended up going with seven. So let's put that in our design. Here I got one degree, two degree, three, five, and seven. So our array pointed up like this isn't doing us any good, but let's take in between these two boxes is the middle of our A element. And I'm gonna bring this down and let's point our A element at the back row. So it's gonna be between these two boxes. And just so it happens that the bottom of our C element has our front row right in its sights. So just from a coverage standpoint, this is looking good to me. So I like to use 4K as a way to look at coverage because it's a pretty, it's the middle part of the upper end and it's gonna show us coverage pretty well. So if I show the mapping of just our house right array, I can look and see that uh, from a horizontal coverage and vertical coverage, this looks pretty even front to back. Um, so I do want to illustrate that this is a pretty gradual unfurling of the array. You never want to have a one degree, then like five degrees, then 10 degrees. That's pretty severe. Um, and so we are going to use the top element, that A element of a really narrow splay of one degree for it to couple and go farther. And then this wider opening at the bottom to have it not be such a big deal, uh, so loud at the front. So I'm going to hide this mapping. And now we're gonna look at the frequency response of this. So success for me um, is usually having a front to back spread of SPL of about six dB. Um, so now I'm gonna pull up basically three different designs that I tried. So this is what I ended up with, the one, two, three, five, seven. And so this is the same as you see in the software. Uh, so where Merlin Van Veen via his article and Bob McCarthy differ is that uh, Bob wants to match the range ratio to the coverage ratio. Uh, and so an easy way to do that is instead of having the first box be at one to seven, I just moved it up from two to seven. Um, and so how I did that was right here in this. Um, so this two to seven approach actually has the array be more tonally uniform front to back. Cause remember one is the very front. Then as he's moved down, it's getting farther back in the audience. The, the only downside to this array is that I have a pretty big gap. Let's just measure here at 2K over. Um, that is at basically 95 and a half. And then to the front row, 105, that is a 10 dB difference from front to back at that frequency, okay? Uh, which isn't 
terrible. And I know that the back of the audience is probably sitting at the back because they don't want to be blasted at the front. So I'm not too worried about it. But it's a little bit more than I'd like. So if I go to my original, the what we just did, and I measure that, I can see that I have at 2K, here it's still 95, but then this part at the very back is measuring lower and I don't have as steep of a slope uh, if we just flick back and forth between the two, uh, what's called pink shift. So as you move farther back, there's it's, it's a bigger low end and balanced to top. And so this lifts up those backs where it has not as, quite as much of a high end loss. The other design approach I did is having uh, more of the top box be a three box or the top element being a three box element, a two than a one. So I had three boxes at one degree. So I had three of them all pointed at the back. So it was actually that second box. I was pointed directly at the back row and this lifted that up even more. So you can see here that within this range, this is higher. Um, and then if I go here, you see this droops some, this lifts up some, and this does it even more. Excuse me. Um, so this gives us less of a difference in SPL from front to back at the, you know, what the downside is, is that we have a lot of things having the same high-end response here. So we have a more neutral mid-range, but our high-end converging, versus if we go to this classic Bob McCarthy approach, we have the most tonally uniform from front to back. So a lot of these are kind of just moving parallel to each other. So I ended up going with this middle one of this Merlin Van Veen approach and that it had a, a compromise between tonal uniformity front to back and SPL from front to back. So it's not uh, the, you know, the best array in the world. It would be nice to have a little bit higher trim height and maybe a few more boxes, but for this type of show, I really got it done. Lastly, on this part, I want to speak to this elephant in the room of this giant discrep discrepancy in the low end. Uh, this uh, was, <clears throat> this is just a natural part of what's going to happen in a smaller array of this type. Because if I go now here to side view and let's move down to uh, even just 250 hertz we can see that its energy is, since it's a low frequency, you need a longer line to really steer it. Um, and so <clears throat> the, the line length of array, the same frequency that that's length is basically where you're gonna get 72 degrees of coverage and that's 174 Hertz for this particular array. Um, and so it's just gonna kind of move out spherically. So that's not gonna be as focused and able to go far as the high frequencies. And so, we're just gonna get a lot of that in the front row. And it's even worse if we, if we move down to 125 Hertz and then now all the way down to 63. Um, it's just hard to really get those wave shapes away from spherical towards cylindrical to go out farther. So now let's look how different that looks from let's say 4K where we're able really to shape it and, and move out. So this is just kind of a fact of life. We need a longer array to really steer the low end. And now let me take this and copy the setup to the other line array. And we've copied it and let me bring on this one. And we can now see here with this mapping that I've got a nice even coverage of this whole entire audience. And uh, lastly, I'll bring you to, um, I've got this receiver number six right here in the middle because if some were, were just going to walk up and be like, hey, let's listen to what you got. They're probably going to go right to the middle and the middle of the audience. So I always like to have a receiver or a microphone and other softwares and see what that's going to look like. And in my book, that is a great um, frequency response from one octave smoothing at least. And an, one last kind of low end look I like to see is like, okay, is this too much of a low end rise? Do I really need to maybe do some EQ in the field? Is I like to have maybe an eight to 10 dB uh, increase in low end from 1K uh, to 100 Hertz. So let's look at 1K is at 
uh, let's call it 101, and it's going to slope up. Let's look at about 100, 125. When we go over here, it's at 113. So it's a little bit more than I'd like, but as far as I don't want my array flat, that's just the slope up and low end that I want is there. Um, and so it's a little more than I'd like, <clears throat> but what is making me excited is that I do have uh, a really good at that middle point with both arrays from 1K to 8K. This is not wavering very much at all. So that's a big win in my book is that we definitely have less than a 6 dB variance at the middle of the audience in from 1K to 8K. And why I say that specific range is from 1K to 8K is where the waveguides or the actual directionality of the speaker really starts to take shape and pay attention to your splay angles. Because we illustrated earlier, low frequencies really don't care about a one degree splay versus two degree splay on a box. You need a line length to really make that happen. So um, this is just what you need to pay attention to or not pay attention to and know what's in and out of your control when designing all that. And now let's jump into our front fills. So now I'm gonna get rid of this group. We can see here that these are more or less pointed in the gaps of our mains uh, because it's it's right here in the front where the, the main PA is hung out wide uh, and it's gonna go carry left and right. It is right front and center that needs the most help, which is why we call this a front fill. And then there's probably going to be people standing off to the side of the stage. Um, and so I had those K-12s pointed off to the side to take care of those people. Uh, and let me get this audience zone back here. And now you can see that people standing off here would get it. Um, for some reason, I'm not able to get both the HDL 6As and the K12s to show at once, but you can see more or less, this is just gonna be a flip-flop of that picture. So here's our fills, and then our mains are going where our fills are not. You can see here this yellow um, in the middle is where I'm focusing that fill to make it more of that upper SPL of that red front to back. Okay, now let's have some fun with subs. All right, subwoofers. We're gonna use Map 3 d and put this together. And here's what it looks like from on stage. I had four QSC KW181s, and yes, they are facing each other. I ended up spacing them, if I measure from the center of this cone to the center of this one, about four and a half feet apart. And how did I get that? I used my inline gradient subarray planner, uh, and I work backwards from the crossover frequency. Uh, and what that does is if I know if I'm gonna hand off to the mains at a certain frequency, I know that I get, can get the maximum amount of summation out of my subs um, at another frequency. And that is two thirds of an octave down from that. So the optimal sub center frequency was 63 Hertz. This also tells me the distance I need to space the subs and how much I need to delay the rear sub. Um, I'm not gonna go super in depth right now on how all that math works, but trust if you do that and m verify that measurement in the field, you're gonna get a nice cardioid sub array. So just like a microphone has a cardioid pickup pattern, we're making our subs have a cardioid pattern and I'll show you what that looks like. So if I hit predict at 63 Hertz, we have this nice balloon shape that's a great matching uh, pattern for our audience. It's moving centrally and moving outward. Um, if I were just gonna have one sub in the center, uh, that would just be moving omnidirectional, right? Because low frequencies, they really they take a lot of speakers together in a row to really steer what's going on. So it's gonna move omnidirectional. So this has the added benefit of making a nice shape that covers with my audience like I want. And I'm getting a ton of rejection on the stage. I don't want my low end bleed to going back into my kick drum mic. So if I pull up my measurement viewer, I place a stage, a microphone, a virtual one, out in the audience 20 feet, and then I placed it 20 feet back on stage and I have a 20 dB difference. And so, which is huge. And so to give you some perspective, if I go up here, um, the dB change of 20 dB, that's the same thing as a thousand percent or a 10 X difference. And so I would like to have 10 X low, <laughs> the amount of low end less leaking back into my kickstrap microphone. So that's why I really like this particular inline gradient subarray is that it's not that hard to implement in the field. 
Um, I get predictable results. I get a lot less low end on stage. And if I'm doing a center sub, it really has a nice coverage shape. And so I, and lastly, I want to illustrate uh, just from a coverage standpoint, why I think it's better than a normal left, right sub array. So if I go here to left, right, I have these spaced uh, 40 feet apart. So 20 feet and 20 feet off. If I go to predict, with spaced low end elements, you're gonna get uh, these power alleys and power valleys. So they're coming together at the same time the middle and summing. And then once they kind of get um, more or less out of phase with each other at certain points in the, in the frequency cycle, they're going to cancel out. And so this, this person standing right here is gonna get a completely different experience in low end versus the pr person staying in the middle and it's gonna alternate. And it only gets worse as you move up in frequency. If, if I go to 100 Hertz right at our crossover, uh, we're getting even more uh, just moves through <laughs> this, this cycle of summation and cancellation. And so in contrast, let's pull up our gradient one more time. Um, if we do this, this is a nice even uh, balloon moving out from the subs in a coverage shape that is equal with our audience. So that's why I like this sub array. Okay, so we've we've got our mains, our fill systems, and our subs. That covers the design. Um, I've already got these values loaded into my spreadsheet. And now let's move on to the actual deployment and what I did with the console. All right, let's talk about how I came prepared for system deployment. I want to make sure I had a certain list of assets ready so I could hit the ground running because um, I don't want to do all this design work and have a plan and not be able to make it happen in the field. So in Ease Focus 3, there's a great feature called uh, System Report. So I can go here to Create Report. This is from my finished design file. Um, and I hit OK. And I'll think about it for a second. And I'll open it up. And I now have all of this here in a PDF that can reference. So I'll, I'll throw this in a Google Drive folder or a Dropbox folder and have it here. Uh, and this tells me uh, from my system what's going on. Uh, so I can look and see that the best pinpoint to basically where I need to do a single point hang, where it is, the bottom angle, the distance of the box above ground so I can verify how high I'm getting in the air. I'll attach a uh, tape measure to the bottom of the box. We'll crank it up and once it's at, at is basically at 16 feet, I know I'm high enough. This tells me the rigging angles. And so I know I can look at this and be like, okay, we're putting the boxes together and we're setting the splays. It needs to be one, two, three, five, seven. I know that I did not do any gain shading or anything different on the actual um, boxes themselves. So having this system report is super handy. Uh, I also got M32 edit pulled up. I went ahead and built my console file. So I already got input lists from the different bands. And so I made a scene that was able to fit most of this here. But I want to point out to you is that the uh, I did not have enough matrices to be able to drive the PA in a perfect world. Ideally, I would have a processing output available for each A, B, C, uh, or D part of the array. So I would need three matrices uh, for the array. I wanted to be able to have more control over my front fills and have a sub matrix and my, my outfills. And so I just chose to drive the PA as is, but I used the EQ here, um, ended up using that to do my crossover um, at 100 hertz, uh, I can make that happen. It was a Butterworth 12, um, so 12 dB per octave slope. And then my subs, I ended up leaving alone. And then I could do the same for my off fills. I can make that same um, frequency divider or cross over there in the software. And that's how I ended up doing that. And I did further tuning on the system. <clears throat> and then here I could go to my routing and then outs, uh, and this is where I'd patch everything. This particular set of HDL6As, for whatever reason, they were all polarity inverted, so I inverted them back to be normal. And here, my output delay is where I added uh, the amount of delay on a separate output for the sub to go to my rear subs to make my fancy inline gradient uh, array. Uh, I would normally here pull up smart and show you all the traces that I captured and be like, cool, here's how I tune the whole thing. But unfortunately, after getting the rig up, they had put some flags. Um, they put it actually in front of our rig at first. Uh, but this one, it was super thick and the rig lost all top ends. So we had to take it down and move it off to the side and get it back up. Then a bunch of food trucks showed up and it was windy. 
long story short, we just didn't have time and it was way too noisy to get great data from a tuning perspective. So I just threw my microphones up uh, at the curb and basically time aligned the PA from the tops to the front fills um, and then used it to help fine tune the subarray in the near field, but that was it. Um, Otherwise, I just kind of walked around and said like, okay, it sounds like a PA to me. Um, so I'm sorry I'm not able to show you more of the actual tuning process, but that was it. Let's wrap this up and talk about what I'm gonna do differently next time. What did we learn? We learned to gather good data on the front end, learn everything you can about your speakers, the show expectations, um, the audience size, what you need to have, any, anything that's gonna be in your way as far as trim height, video sight lines, that's all gonna affect where you're gonna be able to put speakers. Then we learned how to use that data we gathered and put it into our design software and into our speaker uh, formulas to make a PA that kind of perform well in the field. We learned about um, range ratio, splay ratio, um, or FAR to make sure horizontal coverage is good. Putting all three of those to work, we really make sure you're able to put place your PA right. And then we learned how to use that design and then have a game plan when you show up. We had our system report ready, our console file built. We had um, all that ready to go so we can, instead of having to ask ourselves, what am I doing? They simply just look at the list and like, okay, here are my splay angles, one, three, four, five, whatever. Um, we can move quickly in the field. So what I do differently is I, was get, I would get to PA tuning faster than I did. It was out of our control to have to take the PA back down and move the flags and put them back up. But um, you know, it's like, oh, hey, I should have known that you know food trucks are gonna show up, those are loud. And so getting the PA tuned quicker uh, would help me. And I would also try a different front fill placement. I had it originally uh, on these, these uh, sticks off to the side, uh, but I'm gonna have it to where it's in the center uh, for that main audience in the front. Don't forget to get my audio toolkit. Uh, that's at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit. It's gonna have the audio mass survival spreadsheet. It's gonna have the speaker database. And it's also gonna have links for you to download the Ease Focus 3 file I have here, my console file, uh, everything that we've been walking through so you can mess with this on your own. Don't forget to say something in the comments. Let me know if you like this. My name is Michael and I will see you on the next one.